Governing Equations for Waveguides. In this video, we're not going to analyze waveguides. We're just going to discuss at a very top level the equations used to analyze them. Then in following videos, we'll start deriving everything and analyzing waveguides. Let's first go through the steps for analyzing a waveguide. Well, the very first one, draw the waveguide, label the dimensions, the material properties, that sort of thing. Understand everything about the waveguide that Maxwell's equations would need to know in order to understand the modes in the waveguide. The next thing we'll do is assume the form of a solution. And basically this will be a picture in the cross section and then some kind of phase constant describing phase accumulation in the direction of the waveguide. Now, the outer, you'll, you'll have an inner part of the waveguide and an outer part. If the outer part is metal, the field will be zero there. If the outer part is dielectric, you'll have a decaying field. You cannot have oscillations outside of the waveguide in a direction leading away from the waveguide, or that would push power away and it would not be a guided mode. We'll take that form of the solution and subst that, substitute that into Maxwell's equations. From there, we'll take into consideration the geometry of the waveguide. Does it have a homogeneous fill? Is one of its directions uniform? Anything like that that we can use to simplify the equations and whittle it down to a single differential equation. When we get that single differential equation, we'll call that the governing equation. It's the thing that you'd have to solve, whether you did it on paper or on a computer. So then somehow we solve that governing equation. In this series of videos, we'll be doing it analytically. And in other courses, I show how to do that numerically. And numerically, you can handle actually much more complicated waveguides that would not have an analytical solution, or at least would not have a very easy one. We'll analyze the waveguide in each of its homogeneous regions. At that point, you'll connect the solutions with boundary conditions. Now, this is easy for a metal waveguide because the field is just zero. But for a dielectric waveguide, we'll have multiple solutions that we need to stitch together. From there, you have the overall field solution applying those boundary conditions. Once we have the solution, then we can start calculating meaningful things like the phase constant, the characteristic impedance, what the fields look like, and then we can learn from that. So we have Maxwell's equations and wave equations in various forms. So let's talk through this. When we're analyzing waves, this really comes from Maxwell's curl equations. So these two equations contain all the information we need to know to analyze a waveguide. Now in general media, which can be inhomogeneous, we get a wave equation where, in this case, we're solving for the electric field. So we have a permeability stuck in this curl operation. And because permeability can be inhomogeneous, we can't bring it to the outside of this spatial derivative. In this case, it's a curl operation. And we really can't do anything else with this equation. Now, analytically, this is very difficult to solve, but this type of equation is used mostly on computers when we solve it numerically. Solving it on paper, we need the medium that we're solving in to be homogeneous. And if we want to analyze something inhomogeneous, we would divide it up into homogeneous sections, solve each one of those, and connect those sections through boundary conditions. But let's say we have something that's linear, homogeneous, isotropic. This wave equation that we just derived, well, the mu can come to the outside of the curls. It can then come over to the right-hand side of the equation. We have this double curl, and we eventually whittle that down to a single wave equation that we can solve but that's specific to linear homogeneous isotropic waves or media, sorry. And so in that case, this one vector equation decouples into three independent sets. And so we would actually solve each one of these independently. Now they're the same equation, they have the same solution, and then we would bring them all together. Let's examine what would happen with Maxwell's equations if we know the form of the solution for a waveguide. So let's have the, the curl equations. We start there. Each one of these is a vector equation that can each expand into a set of three scalar equations. 
So in total, we have six coupled partial differential equations. Now, in this case, we have six field components in general that we would need to solve for. And that's a lot of field components. And you'll see all the tricks that we apply later to simplify this down. Now let's discuss what the form of the solution looks like in a waveguide. So on the right, I'm anim animating a waveguide. This is a rectangular metal waveguide. And I'm looking at one of the modes in here. It is not the first order mode. And there's two pieces to this when we're talking about a mode in the waveguide. There's what the cross section looks like. And this cross section does not change. It's the same picture always. The only thing that happens is that it accumulates phase according to the phase constant. That's the second piece of information. So a solution to a waveguide has the picture of the mode in the cross section. That's what the fields look like. And then it has this phase constant that describes how it, it propagates. Now we might look at this in the waveguide and say, well, that doesn't always look like this picture. You know, the blues and the greens will swap. Well, in fact, it does. It's just that this cross section is accumulating phase and what I'm drawing in the waveguide is the real part of that. But if I were to stop time and if I could draw the complex fields, it would always look like what's in this cross section. So the overall field, whatever that is, is the product of these two things. It's this picture in the cross section of what the fields look like times e to the minus j beta z, where beta is describing the accumulation of phase in the longitudinal direction. What this really means is, even though a waveguide is a three-dimensional thing, it reduces to a two-dimensional analysis. So that has great implications numerically when a three-dimensional thing is, is much more computationally inefficient and more difficult to analyze. Uh, on paper, it also simplifies a bit because we have one less dimension. So if our waveguide looked all crazy, some kind of you know bumpy, starry thing, if we just looked at that waveguide in the cross section, this is all we would have to analyze to calculate what the modes look like, how many modes there are, their propagation constants, their phase constants, their characteristic impedance, all of this sort of stuff that we wanna know. So in general, waveguide analysis reduces to a two-dimensional problem. So assuming this is what the solution looks like, we just talked through the electric field, it's the same story for the magnetic field, so I won't repeat that. If we plug that into our six coupled partial differential equations and simplify, this is the set of equations that we arrive at. Notice there is no longer a Z derivative. That's because these two functions, when you differentiate them with respect to Z, it's a minus J beta Z that comes out. Otherwise, the field component is unchanged. So the Z derivatives, there's just now a J beta sitting there. And instead of having E Z, H Z, H X, H Y, it's an E naught Z, an E naught Y, an H naught X, because that's the vector components of these two-dimensional pictures that we talked about up here, the field profiles. But we still have six field components that we need to solve for. But no matter what we do, no matter what kind of waveguide analysis we do, all waveguide analysis starts with these six equations. And I think that's very interesting. Now from there, the different waveguide analyses will look very different, but that is the starting point for all of them. In my mind, when I am analyzing a waveguide or transmission line, so waveguide's the generic term, I, I step through this kind of a process. And the first thing I ask myself, is that a transmission line? If it has two or more conductors, it is a transmission line. So if it is a transmission line, the next thing I ask myself, does it have a homogeneous fill? Are there any field lines that penetrate more than one dielectric? If the answer is yes, that it has a homogeneous fill, so the field lines stay in the same dielectric the whole time, that transmission line supports TEM. This is typically the only mode that's used in a transmission line. But if you go to a high enough frequency, then you'll start seeing TE and TM modes as well. If it does not have a homogeneous fill, then it supports hybrid modes. 
And very often, it's sometimes a good approximation, maybe even almost always a good approximation, if we we're solving this numerically or analytically, to assume that they're TEM, solve it as if it's TEM, and we get answers that resemble very closely if we didn't make that approximation, but did a heck of a lot more work to get the answer. So those are called quasi-TEM, where it's not actually a TEM mode, but it's analyzed that way, and you get an answer that's almost as good and a lot easier. That's the reason for it. So now backing up back to this original question, is it a transmission line? If it's not, then this would be what most of the world would just call a waveguide. I know waveguide's the generic term, but most of the time when waveguide is said, it's meaning the type of waveguide that is not a transmission line. So at this point, we have something that's not a transmission line, so a waveguide. I'd ask myself again, does it have a homogeneous dielectric? If it does, then it supports TE and TM modes, and that simplifies analysis, and I would definitely go in that direction. If it doesn't, then I ask myself, does it at least have one uniform direction, like a slab waveguide? But even a rectangular waveguide may have an inhomogeneous dielectric, but maybe that inhomogeneity is only along one axis. The other axis, it's perfectly uniform. And I'm not talking about the Z direction here. It's the X or Y directions. Does it have a uniform direction? If it does, then it still supports TE and TM modes. And that's because in that uniform direction, a spatial derivative will go to zero, which then separates things into TE and TM. Well, if it doesn't have that uniform direction, it's inhomogeneous, it has what's called hybrid modes. And that's a more difficult analysis. But even when we do that, we actually notice that a lot of these are very nearly linearly polarized. And kind of like we did a quasi-TEM uh, analysis up here, uh, we can do sort of a quasi-LP analysis and just assume that the other polarization for the field component is zero, do an analysis. That's an approximation is no longer rigorous, but we can much more efficiently get answers that are almost as good. But in general, hybrid modes are more difficult. They involve all six field components. Here is how I like to map out waveguide analysis. The most difficult, if it is nonlinear, inhomogeneous, or anisotropic, all six field components are coupled, and it becomes a difficult analysis. So neither EZ or HZ is zero. We have to solve for both of them. And even if we did this code, and typically this is done on a computer numerically, even this can actually analyze all the other cases because this is the most difficult. It's just that you would have done unnecessary calculations and done it in a less efficient way. But those are called hybrid modes when you have all six field components. If we're analyzing transmission lines and there's a homogeneous dielectric, so that transmission line supports TEM modes, since that's TEM, both E naught Z and H naught Z is zero. But there's conditions for that, right? It has to be a transmission line, homogeneous feel. Uh, but that's an easy analysis. We can do that with electrostatics, and you'll also see how a field analysis can also take us there. Now, if we have a waveguide that's not a transmission line, and it has a homogeneous fill, E naught Z and H naught Z are independent equations. That means there will be a solution for H naught Z when E naught Z is zero. And likewise, there'll be a solution for E naught Z when H naught Z is zero. And that's the origin of the TE and the TM modes. When E naught Z is zero, the electric field is completely tangential to the direction of propagation, and we call that a TE mode. Likewise, when H naught Z is zero, the H field is completely tangential to the direction of propagation, which is Z. So we call that a TM mode. And then last, we've been talking about channel waveguides. There's also slab waveguides. And one of the dimensions is completely infinite, infinite extent. And in this case, the math simplifies down to something one dimensional. And in fact, Maxwell's equations decouple into two independent sets of modes, and one we would call E, or sorry, one we would call TE, the other we would call TM. I'm going to end this just with a sneak peek at what the equations will look like when we analyze something. 
And the first thing is we need to identify the transmission lines that a waveguide does it support TEM, TE, TM, hybrid modes, because each of these will take us in a slightly different direction that I'm about to show. And so each has a different analysis set up. Let's look at that. If it's TEM, yes, there is a rigorous field way to get to the TEM analysis, but we can also analyze this as a electrostatics problem, which we've already done. We did this in electrostatics. If it supports TE modes, we're solving a differential equation for H naught Z and E naught Z is zero. For TM analysis, it's the opposite. We solve a differential equation for E naught Z and we'll let H Z be zero. If it supports hybrid modes, look at this big ugly thing. And as I mentioned, I don't, I'm sure somebody has done this analytically in the past, but uh, me, myself, I've only ever done that numerically. And despite it looking rather intimidating, it's quite easy to solve numerically. And then for slab waveguides, uh, this will have a uniform direction in a direction in the cross section and Maxwell's equations will separate and it'll be a TE and a TM mode. But again, it's a, it's a single differential equation for each. So to know everything about the slab waveguide, we'd actually have to solve for both. Just like if we have a waveguide, there isn't a way, any waveguide I know of that supports TE modes and not TM. It's, it's one or the other. So to know everything about those waveguides, we'd have to solve both. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for using EMPossible. I want to create more videos and I want to continue to improve how electromagnetics and computation is taught online. To do that, it will really help me if you can like this video and subscribe to our channel. I also want you to know we have a lot more content that you may not be aware of. See everything we have to offer at eimpossible.net.